Well, you saw the title of this video, so let's get the crapping it started. Revelations is frequently regarded to be the last great AC game before Big Bad AC3 came along and ruined everything. Anything that came after it was either a disappointment or is that straight too far away from the esoteric original vision that the writers apparently had in mind for the franchise. You can call yourself a true Assassin's Creed fan if you don't have a set of games that you relentlessly shit on, so let the revelation serve as my lavatory as I complain about an 11 year old game. I am going to make the pretentious disclaimer here that I have played every single mainline AC game, with the exception of Syndicate. I truly believe Revelations is the worst game in the franchise when compared to the other games I've played. I have also 100%ed these games on numerous occasions and I am about as intimate with them as I am with my right hand. Before I tear into this helpless game, I will highlight some aspects that I truly did enjoy. The soundtrack is amazing. I know it is completely and utterly subjective, but Revelations may very well have the best soundtrack in the series. Given how it apparently manages to overshadow the trillions of issues that the story has. Janissaries being able to resist the usual cheese tactics was a step in the right direction. Combat is still pretty easy due to your gigantic help bar and your ability to instantly cobble up medicine. But it's still a shame that AC3 made combat even easier. Almost the entire map is open to you from the start. You can capture all the tents and renovate all the buildings before you even reach the first memory seal. The game also doesn't really waste your time in handing out all your tools and equipment. The movement additions from the hook blade were also a welcome addition. Zip lines and the split second decisions you make when encountering lampos were something that I missed in the next games. Constantinople also looks fantastic with its vibrant art style. I have seen complaints that the city looks mostly the same, but it's not nearly as bad as say Florence or Boston. And lastly, I genuinely enjoy 10 defense and consider it the best implemented new feature of Revelations. Enough with the praise, let's get this show on the road. Starting with the story. It is not an uncommon claim to hear that the Revelations is the best written game in the franchise and how it is a perfect ending to Ezio. Clearly, I must be missing something very obvious here. When I look at the story of Revelations, I see a Russian doom death mess that desperately tries to pad itself out in order to justify its price tag. The story absolutely breaks Ezio's characterization from the previous games and provides practically no explanation for what are essentially acts of terrorism that it commits throughout the game. The characters constantly wipe their asses with the very thing that the series is named after, while the story attempts to be some deep introspective send off to Ezio, but force flan on his face when it starts contradicting the very messages it is trying to convey. So in order to open this can of worms, we are going to have to start from the very beginning. An inexplicably race lit testament wakes up on the Animus Island, a simulation of the most basic features of the Animus. He is created by 16 who informs Desmond that he is in a coma and that finding a sync nexus, a moment in both Altair and Ezio's lives where they have nothing left to show Desmond, is the only way for him to wake up. So Desmond heads through the memory portal to find it. Congratulations, you have now experienced the entirety of Revelations as modern day plot. There are a few moments where Desmond is pulled out but they lead absolutely nowhere. There is a brief scene with 16 talking about inhabiting Desmond's body but nothing comes of it. Occasionally, you will hear conversations from outside the Animus, but they move nothing along. There are the memory platforming minigames that I'll talk about later, but their stories are not relevant to the overall narrative. Unless you play the DLC, you will never even know the reasons for Lucy's betrayal. The big twist of Brotherhood is only briefly mentioned in a few lines of dialogue. Also, do you remember the cryptic messages 16 tried to convey in the previous games? The ones that implied how much he knew? That he had such short shattering information but just couldn't convey it properly. <laughs> yes. <coughs> yes. Subject 17. You're dead. I saw your blood. No time. It is far later than you know. Too late to save them. Who? She is not who you think she is. Everything you hope to become, everything you hold dear, it's already gone. Explain. Please. Eden. She... In Eden. Find Eve. The key... 
her DNA. Tell me. I cannot. The son. Your son. You're too weak. I must replenish energy. Don't go! I am with you till the end. Find me in the darkness. Well, here Desmond and Sixteen have an opportunity to speak freely face to face, but both they and the riders pretend that this never happened. But the fan base will still continue to pretend that it was AC3 that started dropping previously established plot points. The modern day parts of Revelations are a joke and they did not justify an entire game. Now, while the fan base does love fetishizing the modern day segments of the older games, they still had significant pacing issues and were often unengaging from a gameplay perspective. Despite that, they were the clue that kept the games together. And even if they didn't always move the story along, they did give more information and backstory about the world. Other than the unengaging gameplay, I can't say the same for the modern day Revelations. Nothing meaningful happens on the Animus Island. You could shove the last 5 minutes of Revelations to the beginning of AC3 and absolutely nothing would change. Ezio's story begins with him traveling the world. We learn that he has spent the last few years searching for something called the Library. Not much is known about the Library, other than the fact that it was built by Altair and that it potentially houses something very powerful. Ezio claims to seek the answer to two things, his place in the world and why the struggle between the Assassins and Templars always leads to chaos. His journey takes him to Masia, where he is greeted by a Templar army. Ezio charges in, accurately showing the negative impact the killstreak system had on stealth, but gets captured when he sees a vision of Altair. Leandros, the bold Templar captain with anger issues, attempts to hang Ezio, but he manages to bullshit his way out of it and fall like 15 meters without any visible injuries. We get the climbing and assassination tutorials, as Ezio follows the ghostly Altair to the top of the fortress. Why Altair seemingly decided to climb to the top is never explained. He finds an eagle statue at the top, kicks it down and jumps after it immediately. He is very fortunate that he managed to create a hole that just happened to be filled with water. We are not even 10 minutes in and Ezio has already taken on an army of Templars, survived the fall that would have turned his legs into ketchup and done that ridiculous stunt with the eagle statue. The game has to resort to over the top set pieces to keep the player engaged and as we are going to see later, it is going to bite it in the ass. The hole conveniently leads him to the entrance of the library and as the nearby indentured worker explains, he's going to need 5 keys to open it and the Templars have already found one. Before we go any further, why did the assassins build the library at the one spot that they have publicly used in recorded history? Even if the Templars can't get through, they can still fortify the surrounding area as we saw in the beginning. Ezio catches up with Leandros but gets injured after the brief chase sequence. But not too injured given how your injuries seem to disappear as soon as you enter combat. Leandros is sent back to Lumbridge and Ezio learns that the remaining keys can be found in Istanbul. Ezio arrives in Istanbul and we are introduced to Prince Suleiman, the man who will grow up to become a ruthless conqueror is portrayed as this cute soft spoken 17 year old. Ezio also supposedly notices Sofia for the first time, despite being on the same boat as her for at least several days. We are greeted by Yusuf, who gives us an exposition thump into the situation of the city. The Ottoman guards are apparently aware of the assassins and even tolerate their presence to a degree. We also learn that there is a faction of Byzantine remnants who are making moves in the city, while the Sultan's attention is focused on the civil war taking place elsewhere. Ezio gets the hook blade and we are given some basic tutorials that involve running around the city and climbing the Kalata Tower. I would like to lead your attention to the fact that the assassins are openly training in the middle of the street and no one apparently cares. Here's a drinking game, every time the assassins break their creed or their basic principles, take a shot. Bad news, Templars are attacking two dens. An army of Templars is on the way to the Kalata Den. I'm sure the den being covered in bright assassin flags has nothing to do with where the Templars know where to attack. And the following serves as an introduction to the infamous 10 defense mechanic. If you were expecting me to trash on it then you are going to be disappointed, because 10 defense is a competently made tower defense minigame. Unlike the game's combat, 10 defense requires proper strategy and it can be quite challenging at times. There is something of a rock paper scissors look to this game type and that alone gives you more depth than a combat in the first 7 AC games combined. 
even if you hate ten defense it is trivial easy to avoid. Istanbul has no shortage of herald supply pursuers to kill. Stuff you should be doing anyway as, you know, an assassin. Apart from the tutorial, you will only encounter ten defenses if you specifically go out of your way to cause them. This feature that actually punishes unassassin like behavior is one of the few aspects of the game that actually gets criticized. Let that sink in. Ten defense is one of the few mechanics of the game that is actually well implemented and I will stand by that. Though narratively it is still absurd. These two secret organizations are having open warfare on the streets of a densely populated city. The Ottoman guards must be on a collective smoke break while literal siege engines are being hauled through the streets. Also, here is a shout out to the four guards from AC2 pushing the battering ram. This is less than an hour into the main story and this somehow slipped through the playtesting. After all of this is done, we regroup with Yusuf and learn that the Bazaar Den was captured by the Templars. The sequence ends as the Bazaar Den gets recaptured. We are informed that a few assassins got killed during the entirely avoidable attack on the den, so it is up to Ezio to recruit more. He finds some people locked in a cage, so he rescues one of them, apparently leaves the rest of them to rot, and recruits the man to be killed for the next time the Templars decide to attack. The next mission introduces us to the Master Assassin missions. They consist of two parts, and these two are a part of the main story. The first one has a deal with a turncoat assassin who manages to escape. The second one has the turn to capture a few assassins and launch an attack on the main den. The trader's name is Valis Seltradat and the reason he betrayed the assassins is because they stood idly by while the Ottomans ravaged his home country. Once your greed was as vital to me as air and water. But when the Turks marched into Wallachia and you assassins did nothing to stop it, how could I continue to believe? If a man's philosophy does not let him protect his people, his home, and his family. What good can it do for the world? Peace be with you. Now, this is a thought-provoking point, and it's one of the few times the game actually attempts to portray the assassin's actions as morally questionable, but that is all dropped like a sack of rotten potatoes. Ezio's and his recruits' response amounts to a single request in peace and they just go on with their lives. None of Valis' grievances are addressed or even acknowledged. And let's think on that for a moment here. The Ottoman Empire, an aggressive and slave trading empire, is supported by the assassins who are supposed to value peace and freedom. Remember, just in the previous games, the assassins opposed Cesare for his plans to violently unite Italy, but the Ottomans doing the same on an even larger scale is apparently a okay. Apart from that one brief moment with Vali, the game never makes mention of this discrepancy. No one has an issue with the assassin supporting the Ottomans when it goes in the face of their ideals. Ezio learns bomb crafting from Yusuf, who in turn directs him to Piri Reis, who in turn directs him to Sofia's shop. The game wastes no time setting Sofia up as a potential love interest, despite the fact that she looks as if she is half the age Ezio is. Ezio finds his way into the cistern that houses one of the keys. The missions where you retrieve the keys are essentially the tombs and lairs from the previous games, except now they are strictly a part of the main story in order to pad it out. Ezio finds the key and returns to Sofia. Ezio also pulls out an Elder Scroll from somewhere, and it is marked with the location of rare books. Ezio and Sofia strike a deal. Ezio will find the rare books, while she will find the location of the keys. At some point Ezio also helps the Romanis, but this contributes absolutely nothing and is clearly here to pat the game out. Upon returning to the den, Ezio discovers that the keys are capable of streaming Altair's memories. The Altair memories are frequently cited to be a highlight of revelations, but I fail to see how. You could remove them from the game and neither Desmond's nor Ezio's story would change. Ezio never needed the memories, he only needed the keys themselves. Couple that with the fact that all of them reused the Masia area from the first game and this is probably the most egregious example of Revelation desperately padding out its playtime. In this memory that takes place before the first game, Altair helps fight off a Templar attack. As they are, Ezio just looks at the memories, mutters something along the lines of how cool Altair is and absolutely nothing comes of it. The next sequence has us infiltrating the Ottoman palace to stop the potential assassination of Prince Suleiman. In order to achieve that, the assassins ruthlessly beat up the minstrels and steal their clothes. The mission itself is quite boring where you just simply scan people until you find the right one. After the minstrel plot, we are also introduced to Prince Ahmed and Tariq, captain of the Janissaries. 
Gameplay-wise, the following mission consists entirely of etching on moving 100 meters from point A to point B in order to eavesdrop on Tariq, Ahmed and Suleiman. Ahmed is not trusted by the Janissaries who accuse him of being weak and passive. You are weak, Ahmed. Pensive in times of war and restless in times of peace. You lack passion for the traditions of the Ghazi, yet you speak of fraternity in the company of infidels. You make a decent philosopher, Ahmed. But you will be a poor sultan. You may show yourself out. Suleiman and Ezio discuss the situation and Ezio agrees to investigate Tariq even further. Ezio also runs into Sofia at the talk show is there because her shipment got delayed. So he sneaks in and probably kills the two guards guarding it because of a bureaucratic plunder. Her package reveals the location of the next memory seal, so Ezio has to climb the Kalata Tower for the second time. The next memory takes place right after the events of the first game, where Altair attempts to dispose of Easy Peach Corpse in order to make sure that there are no more illusions. Also, Apost tries to steal the apple, but none of it really matters. Ezio shambles around the bazaar, like an elderly person looking for a toilet at the supermarket. He comes across a merchant who complains that the Janissaries confiscated a set of Papus Karaks and promises to get them back. He never gets them back. Ezio starts stealing Tariq, and I actually quite like this mission. The missions in Revelations are rarely designed in a way that let you utilize social stealth, but this isn't one of them. It's a tailing mission done right, and you can even get creative with the bombs. Tariq is to meet Manuel Palaiologos, a descendant of the last Byzantine Emperor, at the gates of the arsenal, a heavily militarized district within the city. Tariq accepts a large amount of money from him, and Ezio and Yusuf plan to find out why. Issue, the way to the arsenal is blocked by a gate. How does the dynamic duo attempt to overcome this obstacle? Perhaps by finding an alternate route. What about a disguise, something that has worked for Ezio several times before? Maybe use a bomb to blow open the main gate, given how Revelations introduces bomb crafting. Perfectly sensible ideas, and mainly in line with what we saw in the previous games. No? How about riling up an angry mob to tear down the gate and take the brunt of the Janissary retaliation? I don't think I even need to explain why this tears the first thing in the new one. The assassins are actively putting civilians in harm's way to further their own goals, even when they are sworn not to do that. I have seen people defend this with the claim that the Janissaries were openly screwing over the population, and this was a method to get back at them. Indeed, the opening cutscene even shows Janissaries seemingly harassing a merchant. You are worse than the Byzantines, you traitor! Ah! Hold your tongue, parasite! A merchant that was warned several times beforehand to not set up his stall in front of the entrance. You have been warned twice. No merchants near the arsenal wall. And who still did it anyway. What a poor little merchant. Starting a mass riot because someone couldn't be bothered to set up his stall 10 meters away is totally justified now. And even if you think this is done to show how disillusioned Ezio is about the creed, that does not explain why Yusuf and the rest of the assassins are happily willing to go along with it. The only thing that even remotely resembles an objection is Yusuf saying that this is ungentlemanly. That is it. And before you say that the other assassins look up to Ezio and it is not in their place to question them, remember that Atir was the most gifted assassin in the Order, he was demoted and almost executed, and he spent the entire game paying for his mistakes. The assassins hold off the cars while the civilians open up the gate. They are all seemingly abandoned afterwards as there is no indication that the assassins will continue defending them. It is hilarious though that Yusuf says that getting into the arsenal would require killing everyone. Short of killing everyone, I'm not sure how you will get inside. And Ezio's proposed plan to avoid that ends up killing everyone. Ezio ignores the civilians getting pounded and sneaks into the arsenal to find a shipment of weapons. Tariq is seemingly arming the Byzantines. We also get another Altir memory where his hot wife gets killed. Ezio brings the news of Tariq's apparent betrayal to Suleiman and is requested with killing him. In order to reach Tariq, Ezio kills a Janissary and steals his clothes. Interesting how the disguise plan wasn't even considered at the Arsenal gate, but whatever. I do kinda like this mission. It has an interesting twist on your average social stealth mechanics where you are blending with the Janissaries instead of civilians. Ezio sends Tariq to the Shadow Realm and learns that he was trying to sabotage the Byzantines. 
It's amazing how HO feels regret for killing Tariq, but not a Janissary he murdered and was a naked corpse he left to rot in the animal feed. Suleiman is informed of what happened and they prepare a ship at the docks that will take him to Cappadocia, where most of the Byzantines operate out of. But instead of dealing with something that threatens the assassins and the Ottoman Empire as a whole, Ezio instead goes to visit Sofia and learn the location of another seal. Sofia needs white tulips. That's it? This is why we play the AC games for, right? Ezio only seems to remember the value of stealth and his assassin ideals when he is following a flower merchant. Makes perfect sense that he is actually acting like an assassin when he is doing something that has absolutely nothing to do with the assassins or the Templars. The location of the seal at Maiden's Tower is also one of the most ridiculous contraptions I have ever seen in an AC game. I'm not even complaining here, but they really did build something so massive to house something the size of a toilet paper roll. The memory seal shows an episode of General Hospital where Altair returns to Masyaf and kills Abbas. It is finally time to head for the ship. The Janissaries have erected a massive chain that stretches across the gulf, and Ezio needs to disable it before he can leave. In order to achieve this, Yusuf hands Ezio an extra powerful bomb, something that would have been very useful to freeze the arsenal gate, but whatever. The tower suspending the chain is destroyed, but the ship is still blocked by Janissary fleet. So Ezio uses the power of anachronism to conjure a Greek fire siphon that he uses to set the Janissary fleet ablaze. Keep in mind that the Janissaries are not even aligned to the Templars and their leader was actively working to bring them down. Never mind the massive amount of collateral damage. And absolutely no one seems to take issue with this. And if you think this is another example of a disillusioned Ezio, listen to the soundtrack that plays at the end of the sequence. Now if you still believe Revelations is a well written game, then I assume you skipped this particular sequence as it easily provides the most egregious examples of Revelations being the Russian tone deaf mystery it truly is. Ezio reaches Cappadocia and discovers that the Byzantine space of operations is a city located within a giant cavern. About a thousand years of history is condensed to portray the Byzantines as a bunch of brutish and incompetent cave dwellers. After finding the leader of the Ottoman spies, Dilara, Ezio attempts to stop Shakulu, Manuel's right-hand man, from executing more spies. Ezio pounces on Shakulu and delivers the following gem. Men who make a fetish out of murder deserve no pity. When he has skill moves like this. Shakulu shakes off the multiple stab wounds to the neck like an overleveled enemy in Odyssey and we get something that resembles a boss fight until he is put down. Issue? Ezio cannot find Manuel. What do the assassins usually do when he can't find their target? If you answered, gather information, and formulate a plan based on that information, then revelations will say you're wrong. Ezio instead cooks up the following convoluted plan. Set the gunpowder storehouse on fire and panic the population of the city. Have Manuel appear in order to calm them down, and kill Manuel when he is addressing the crowd. I repeat, Ezio wants to start a fire in a densely packed underground city to force one person out of hiding. If the arsenal gate shut the bed, then Cabarocha not only shits it, but it doesn't even attempt to change the sheets afterwards. Ezio is endangering civilians on an even larger scale than the arsenal gate, and he doesn't even attempt any other solutions. Ezio's plan does work though. The civilians are now understandably upset that they're going to burn to death, and Manuel starts running for the hills when he sees Ezio. Stop and think for a moment. Think about the life you have disrupted today. The anarchy you have sown here. You. You take advantage of a poor and displaced people, using us to further your own vain quest. I love how Manuel rightfully calls out Ezio for his PS and Ezio's response essentially amounts to a no you. Templars are always quick to talk of peace, but very slow to concede power. 
It's your Shanks Manuel and retrieves his memory seal, only to turn around and find Ahmet on a boat. Turns out Ahmet has been the real Grandmaster of the Templars all along. He was just in Istanbul when Ezio left and I like the thought that he came to Cappadocia just to mock Ezio. Also, Ezio, this is the perfect time to use your hidden gun or your palms, just saying. The Templars are aware of Sophia, so Ezio rushes off to save her. He uses his main character privileges to escape Cappadocia while everyone else dies around him. We cut to another Altair memory commercial break where he hands over the memory seals to the Polo brothers, explaining how they got to Istanbul. So, Cappadocia. I don't even know where to begin. This is an absolute monkey fuck from a writing standpoint. I've seen people defend this scene in a variety of ways, so let's get over them and explain why they are lacking. 1. Ezio never intended to cause civilian deaths. False. He was perfectly aware of what was going to happen. Not only did Dilara warn him that all hell will break loose. Explosions? If you do that, all hell will break loose. You will panic the entire city. See, I am counting on it. Ezio even tells her to start running while she still has a chance. Keep out of sight until you hear the explosions. Then you run. And even if we assume that it was accidental, the plan itself was meant to cause panic among the people. Panic that would not have arisen if there wasn't a real, tangible threat to their lives. No matter how you view it, Ezio willingly endangered innocence to reach Manuel, which in turn left countless people dead. Though after the arsenal gate, maybe we shouldn't be surprised. 2. Ezio was in a hurry. False. There is nothing in the game to indicate that. For all the game gives us, he had all the time in the world to formulate a better plan. 3. Ezio had no other options. This would be believable if the game actually bothers to show Ezio considering other options and explaining why they wouldn't work. Now if you're going to break the creed, you're going to have to provide at least some sort of explanation for it. Or at least show some consequences. Neither of which Sequence 7 does. 4. Ezio regretted all of it, so it is okay from a storytelling perspective. Ezio makes it to the boat, stares at the smoking entrance with a blank face for a few seconds, and then stares into the memory seal until the sequence ends. Ezio and the riders are more concerned with the memory seal rather than acknowledging his role in innocent deaths. This atrocity is never again brought up in the game, and life just goes on as before. Though we do actually learn that Ezio regretted some of his actions nine years later in Valhalla. Can you truly say that the game is well written when it took the riders nine cycles around the sun to address something that the character would have never done otherwise? The funny thing here is that, before Valhalla was released, everyone just sort of pretend that Cappadocia never happened, you never saw it come up in discussions surrounding the game. And once Valhalla was released, Cappadocia retroactively became some masterful piece of storytelling, despite revelations itself doing absolutely nothing to portray the event as anything out of the ordinary. Ezio returns to Istanbul and finds a dead Yusuf at Sofia's shop. Unangered Ezio storms the arsenal where Ahmet and his boys are located, throwing stealth out of the window once more. A cornered Ahmet spouts some rather interesting things about how he would destroy the superstitions that keep mankind divided, almost like an assassin would. I will open that library, and I will find the Grand Temple, and with the power that is hidden there, I will destroy the superstitions that keep men divided. This, along with Tariq's accusation that Ahmed would be meek and passive, makes it clear that the game is trying to portray Ahmed as a reasonable figure. Quite significant given how most of the villains in the Ezio games can be summed up as either evil or greedy. Ezio is told to bring the seals to Kalata Tower in exchange for Sophia. Before that happens though, we take a brief detour to see Ezio appoint some randomly generated assassin recruit to replace Yusuf. Ezio even talks about how important it is for the recruit to uphold the creed, just like Yusuf, despite supposedly being embittered by the cause himself and how Yusuf was perfectly fine with sacrificing civilians at the arsenal gate. I've seen people say that after Cappadocia, Ezio is done with the assassins and only cares about Sophia. This scene proves the opposite, he stresses the importance of the creed and ensures that the Ottoman branch remains functioning. Ezio constantly flip-flops his allegiances to the point that the riding feels schizophrenic. Ezio finally meets up with Ahmet. I find it very strange how none of the other assassins seem to take issue with the fact that Ezio is handing the keys to the library over, despite the immense power it supposedly contains. Ahmet proudly shows Sophia being held at the top of the tower and slinks off after getting the memory seals. So Ezio climbs the Kalata tower for the third time and realizes that the girl was a decoy. 
he notices the real Sophia being hanged on the other side of the district. I'm surprised Ezio didn't throw the fake Sophia around the tower just cause, given how little he is shown to care for innocent lives at this point. Also, remember all those moments that tried to build up Meta up as this noble and reasonable figure? Now it is all flushed down the toilet. There is literally nothing for him to gain from killing Sophia at this point, but he tries it anyway. Ezio reaches Sophia in time, but the pair is forced to escape. They steal the only pair of horses in Istanbul like a horny ekra politician, which is by far the worst crime he has committed. They catch up with Ahmed and we're given a long set piece that involves ramming carriages and parachuting. This all ends with this awkward mid-air slap fight where they fall continuously for like 20 seconds. Why Ezio doesn't just shank Ahmed in the neck is beyond me. Ezio deploys his parachute in time and lands with Ahmed in a very romantic manner. The lovebirds happen to land near Selim, one of the two claims to the throne who murderizes Ahmed. Also, Sophia makes it down there, despite Ezio and Ahmed having to fall the height of Mount Everest to make it down. Did she also have a parachute? Selim tells Ezio to leave and in response, Ezio attempts to strike the guy down in front of his army and only stops because Sophia tells him to. I thought Ezio was supposed to be done with all of this, but it looks like he's just looking for more trouble. And it looks like he's willing to risk Sophia's life too, despite all the trouble he went through to save her. But I'm sure someone will show up in a comment section and say that this is actually brilliant writing because Ezio is suffering from schizophrenia, so why do I even bother? The final sequence has Ezio arrive at Masyaf with Sophia. As they walk up to the castle, Ezio is passionately reciting the creed despite supposedly being done with the assassins. The library is opened, and Ezio finds the fossilized remains of Altairosaurus. Altair's pony ass contains the final memory seal. The seal shows Altair saying goodbye to his son and entering the library. It must stay hidden therein, far from eager hands, at least until it has passed on the secret it contains. If you are asked, say I sent the apple away. Tell them I sent the cypress or Sifango or that I dropped it into the sea. Tell them anything to keep men away from this place. This apple must not be found. Not until the time is right. So why on earth did you build the vault to hide the apple at the one spot that the assassins have publicly used in recorded history? Altair's son could have taken the apple with him and hid it under his mattress, and it would have been a better hiding spot. Also, do you remember the Templar garrison at the beginning of the game? Yeah, me neither. Ezio finishes the memory and walks towards the apple. He decides to leave it where it is, and for the first time ever, speaks to Desmond directly. I have lived my life as best I could, not knowing its purpose, but drawn forward like a moth to a distant moon. And here at last, I discover a strange truth. That I am only a conduit for a message that eludes my understanding. He claims not having known the purpose of his life until now. That he is nothing but a messenger, despite Minerva making it blatantly clear at the end of AC2. Who is Desmond? I have so many questions. Please explain yourself. Enough. I do not wish to speak with you, but through you. You have served your role here. Unless Ezio had short-term memory or he was growing senile by age, that is something he should have already known. He might not have accepted it until now, but he should have been perfectly aware that he was nothing but a conduit between the first civilization and Desmond. Ezio then puts his hand on an apparition of Desmond and we see a first civilization figure that we have never seen before. He points Desmond to the Grand Temple and shows a vision of the sun ejaculating and causing earthquakes. We also see a baby die, which is great. How did Ezio even know that something like this would happen? It's like he just figured out that he was going to give Desmond a vision at this exact moment. And why is it only here that Desmond receives this message? Why not in the vault with Minerva, or any other moment in Ezio's life that Desmond observes? The game does not bother answering that. Ezio then decides to leave the apple in the vault, despite Templar showing an interest in this area. Desmond wakes up in the van, surrounded by the gang and his dad. He opened the van doors and... They are already at the entrance to the Grand Temple. Quite strange given how the game made it clear at the beginning that he couldn't monitor Desmond's memories to keep him stable. 
Okay, I shut down the enemy's monitoring system to free up a lot of memory, but even like this, it's still risky. They are only here because the riders needed to end the game. And your reward for suffering through revelations is an unskippable 20 minute cutscene. Enjoy. That was a lot of complaining. Let's summarize the biggest issues. Ezio and the assassin shit all over the creel without repercussions or even acknowledgement. Let's count all the moments Ezio and the assassins break out of the creed or their basic principles during the course of Revelations. If you followed along with the drinking game I proposed earlier, then you no longer have a functioning liver. They openly train in the streets. They decorate their tents with pride assassin insignias. They are completely fine with the aggressive, expanding and slave trading Ottoman Empire. They regularly seem to have open warfare with the Templars on the streets of a populated city. They sacrifice innocents for their own gain at the Arsenal Gate. Ezio kills Tariq, an innocent man. The assassins are perfectly fine with burning down an entire fleet and a harbor when they aren't even the main target. Ezio sacks an entire city to smoke out one person. And Ezio will happily trade the Masjaf keys for Sofia. As AC1 showed us, these are the types of things that Coral Tirt the more than almost executed. The only one here that actually gets addressed as a screw up is Ezio killing Tariq, but that is not something that Ezio spends the entire game atoning for, and the only negative thing that comes with it is the Chinese air blockade at the harbor that gets resolved in just a few minutes anyway. There is no situation in the other games where the assassins happily paint a target on the backs of innocents or condemn hundreds to death just to smoke out one person. You could say that by sparing Rodrigo, Ezio broke the never compromise the brotherhood tenet as Monteregioni got attacked later on, but that is something Ezio and the others acknowledge as a mistake and he spends the entirety of the game rectifying this. With the sole exception of Tariq, none of the blatant abuses of the creed or the assassin principles are treated as mistakes. There are no attempts to rectify them, mainly because the writers don't portray them as being mistakes in the first place. Except when they do. Because in two of the Master Assassin missions, a recruit kills an innocent man, an action that Ezio immediately calls out and sends the recruit to think on their mistakes. Brash fool! You killed an innocent man! I have no excuse, Mentor. Forgive me. Or when Ezio is passionately reciting the creed to Sophia. Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. That is rather cynical. It would be if it were doctrine. But it is merely an observation of the nature of reality. To say that nothing is true is to realize that the foundations of society are fragile and that we must be the shepherds of our own civilization. To say that everything is permitted is to understand that we are the architects of our actions and that we must live with our consequences, whether glorious or tragic. And Ezio still shows no regret for practically everything he has committed throughout the game. He faces no consequences or repercussions for the stuff he's pulled and still gets to ride off into the sunset and bang Sophia. The riding is inconsistent when the assassins only adhere to the creed when the riders want them to. It's genuinely hilarious when Rogue gets criticized for making the assassins evil and how they act uncharacteristically. That was a conscious choice on behalf of the riders and the assassins crapping all over the creed caused the downfall of the colonial right. The assassins crapping all over the creed in Revelations is the result of inadequate and inconsistent writing that goes completely unrecognized and unpunished, except when the writers arbitrarily decide that it shouldn't. Compare the way the destruction of Lisbon is handled to Cappadocia. One event haunts the character for the rest of his life and causes him to completely reevaluate everything he knew. The other event gets swiped under the rug. Breaking the creed is kind of a big deal, except in Revelations. The Altair memories are completely unnecessary and they are a blatant attempt to pad the story out. Nothing in Altair's memories is necessary for either Desmond or Ezio. Ezio never needed to see the memories, he just needed the keys themselves. You could remove the memories and the story would play out exactly the same. Ezio would still reach the library and Desmond would still find the Grand Temple. I have seen people suggest that witnessing Altair's life gave Ezio the final push he needed to turn his back on the assassins but his dialogue in the beginning indicates that he was already done with them, making the Altair memories truly redundant. There is a crap load of dissonance between what the game wants us to believe and what we actually see in game. We are supposed to believe that the assassins fight for freedom and free will while they support the slave trading and aggressively expanding empire. We are supposed to believe that these crippled remnants of the Byzantine Empire are somehow a bigger threat than the Ottomans. 
We are supposed to believe that the fight for the poor and downtrodden while opposing the remnants and refugees of an already subjugated nation. We are supposed to believe that Ezio is disillusioned by the creed, but he still goes out of his way to help the Brotherhood. We are supposed to believe that Ezio is tired from the chaos of his life, but happily causes more of it without even considering less violent options. All of that combines to make the Assassins and Ezio look like absolute hypocrites, but the game never really addresses that. The writers don't commit to fully portraying them as either heroic or ambiguous, and they all end up looking schizophrenic as a result. The game does a lackluster job showing Ezio's struggle with the creed and his place in the world. Apart from the very beginning and the very end, Ezio is never shown to struggle with whether or not he is doing the right thing. Anything that would be punished or at least called out in the other games is treated as nothing out of the ordinary. Even when he is sitting alone with the memory seals or writing letters to Claudia, Ezio barely even comments on anything that has happened. Most of his doubts are apparently conveyed in a tie-in novel or the audiologue in Valhalla. You should not need external material or make up insane headcanon to justify this faulty writing. The villains are a joke. Manuel only seems to exist just to make way for Ahmed's big reveal later on. Ahmed though has some build-up and development. The game initially tries to pass him off as this noble and reasonable anti-villain who even talks about breaking the artificial boundaries that keep mankind divided, almost like an assassin. Couple that with Tariq's comment about how soft Ahmed would be, and you get the idea that the writers really wanted to do something special with the final villain of Ezio's life. But all of that is discarded when he tries to swindle Ezio and kill Sofia for practically no reason at all. If the game wanted to portray Ezio as being bitter and disillusioned, it would have made more sense to portray Ezio as the one who is willing to break agreements and make Ahmed the victim here. The villains being a joke applies to the Templars as a whole as well. The game really wants us to think that these Byzantine cavemen who have to buy weapons from the Ottomans themselves are somehow comparable to the other villains in the franchise. The first sequence shows Byzantine soldiers as these bumbling and cowardly idiots who frequently get abused by their superior, and we are somehow supposed to take them seriously. Manuel and Ahmed truly are forgettable. Leandros and Shakulu have more of a presence than these two idiots, and they're not even the main villains. The entirety of the modern day plot can be summed up as Desmond is in a coma, but wakes up. Now I can't really fault revelations for Desmond falling into a coma at the end of Brotherhood, but I can fault the game for not doing anything meaningful with it. Nothing happens that moves the story along, not on the anime silent or with the gang monitoring Desmond. All the build-up and implications that the previous games had for Subject 16 are unceremoniously flushed down the toilet. Side content is something that, up until Revelations, each Assassin's Creed game progressively improved upon. AC1 had extremely repetitive flag collections and citizen rescue missions. The second game added more variety with things like assassination contracts, races and Subject 16 riddles. Brotherhood doubled down on just about everything AC2 introduced while also adding things like Borgia Towers and faction missions with their own little storylines. Revelations proudly breaks this trend by not only having less content than Brotherhood, but also removing perfectly functional content that we had in the previous games without providing anything substantial in return. Now I know there are people out there who will happily pay full price for an open world game and then proceed to ignore 80% of the content in order to play the main story, but I'm not one of them. Side content and the large amount of ways you can complete your missions are one of the main reasons why I play the AC games. And when the main story of Revelations has more holes than rotten Switch cheese, you're naturally going to want to wash some of it down with side content. On that front, Revelations disappoints. Brotherhood set the precedent for excellent side content, and there is no excuse for Revelations to be lacking in this regard. Especially when the game had the same price as Brotherhood on release. Do you remember the 30 or so faction missions from Brotherhood? Well, Revelations only has two. Not two missions per faction, but two missions for the whole game. They essentially serve as tutorials for their respective groups, but there is already very little reason to use them due to a lack of scenarios where they can be used. Factions weren't the only thing Revelations murdered, the War Machine missions were also axed. They were a mechanically unique change of pace from the usual gameplay, and I actually enjoyed the number of ways you could use to approach said War Machines. I already mentioned the tombs being integrated into the main story to pad it out. There are also no equivalents to the Christina missions. They were brief glimpses of Ezio's life that were used to uncover things that AC2 didn't have the time for. There was an opportunity here to give us more insight on why Ezio turned his back on the creep, but of course it wasn't taken. The Animus training room challenges were also removed. Not only were they fun challenges, but they also acted as great tutorials. 
The parkour challenges in particular open my eyes about just how flexible the movement was in the Ezio games. The closest thing you could call an equivalent to them were those weird loading screen tutorials that Revelations added. The previous two games also had puzzles from Subject 16, Revelations doesn't. I guess the memory platforming minigame is something of a replacement, but this is the single most boring piece of content I have done in an easy game. And this is coming from someone who has 100% rogue three times. You are moving through a mostly featureless environment by conjuring up blocks of solid cum and avoiding hazards. This is why we played AC games for, right? Slow and clunky first person platforming. To be fair, it was great hearing more about what Desmond did before he was captured by Abstergo and his own thoughts regarding the creed. But none of this is relevant to the overall narrative and you can just skip them. These could have just been cutscenes, or they could have just reused the actually fun and engaging parkour system instead of making up completely new and boring mechanics. Revelations also introduces the book scanning missions where you climb a high point, scan symbols until you find the correct one, and then reach that symbol. Apart from gathering collectibles, this might just be the most brain dead piece of side content that I have ever seen in the series. Someone in the developer team really liked them as we get to do them three times in the main story. And there's also a handful that serve as side content. The fact that the game even classifies these as side missions is just embarrassing. There is no strategy or depth to them. There are also new special recruitment missions that are more involved than the kill four Templars are racing citizen missions that we usually have. These recruits even have set names, but that is the only thing that separates them from the randomly generated ones. These special recruitments feel like a waste of time. By the time you complete one of them, you could have already recruited two more assassins through regular means. If you level a recruit to 10, you can also assign them to a capture 10, which will unlock two more missions based on the level of your recruit. Completing these missions will prevent the chosen 10 from being attacked by the Templars. They are also the closest equivalents to the Templar hunt missions from Brotherhood, and in a way you might actually treat them as an improvement. The missions are longer, though more linear, and their targets have motives that are not explained entirely through the database. So what's the issue? They are now locked behind an XP grind. You have to play secretary with the assassin management system before you gain access to something that actually resembles meaningful side content. The one bit of content that you could actually consider an improvement and you have to jump through filming hoops to get it. Since I already briefly mentioned it, I'll also talk about the Mediterranean defense minigame. You can now capture cities and assign recruits there to defend it. This will reward you with the cities periodically sending you useless money or redundant bomb ingredients. It is simply not worth the effort. At the end of the day, you are just looking at pieces of text and comparing percentages. Brotherhood never pretended that the assassin management minigame was anything other than a meta to earn XP or money. Revelations adds more complexity to a system that simply didn't need it. The lack of content doesn't just apply to missions, tens are also affected. Not only are there less tens, but there is also less variety to differentiate them. You have a few with two targets, a few with the cowardly captains, and one has a target on the rooftop, but that is pretty much it. The Borgia Towers in Brotherhood had more variety to them. You had some that were in tightly packed streets, others that were in open countrysides with fewer buildings, some were in Roman ruins, and one was even in a labyrinthine catacomb. Even the captains had more variety. Some were on horseback so they had a better chance to escape when they spotted you. Others were in areas where they couldn't be air assassinated. Some were out in the open where they were surrounded by multiple guards. Long and short, Brotherhood simply had more variety with the Porgia Towers than the Revelations has with the Tens. Revelations also has the bomb tutorial missions but I'll talk about them more in depth with the bomb crafting. I'll give you some concrete numbers on the amount of side content between the two games to further highlight the issue. Even if we discount how short and linear many of Revelations' side missions are, that would still leave Brotherhood with 54 missions when compared to Revelations' 37. Let us remove the book scanning, bomb tutorial and special recruitment missions for being overly short and linear, and we are only left with 15 missions that have anything even remotely resembling depth and player agency. I could remove the Christina missions from Brotherhood as they are also pretty simplistic, but that would still leave Brotherhood with more than 3 times as much meaningful side content than Revelations. And unlike in Brotherhood, 80% of the meaningful side missions are now locked behind an XP grind. What is the point of an open world game if there is nothing fun or meaningful to do between missions? The main story, the XP locked master assassin missions, and the Templar Dens are really the only meaningful things you can do. Revelations does not justify its open world setting like the other games do. Bomb crafting was a big selling point to the game and a major new addition over Brotherhood. You are now given the ability to make 120 different combinations of bombs with their own effects, yields and delivery mechanisms. 
It was clearly meant to be a crucial pillar of gameplay, given how you can now manually aim bombs, there are three inventory slots dedicated to them, and how there are bomb crafting stations everywhere. And it's one of the most shallow and tacked on systems in the franchise, that is either here to create the illusion of depth or because the devs ran out of time before they could find the use for most of its aspects. Now, created what created is due, at least conceptually, bomb crafting does solve one of the issues I had in Brotherhood, that being that the various items you would collect were essentially pieces of text that you could sell for money. The items you pick up now in Revelations can actually be put to use in gameplay. Sadly, the bomb crafting in Revelations is filled with so many redundancies that we are now going to have to go over the system piece by piece and explain what works and what doesn't. Bombs consist of three parts, shells, effects and gunpowder. Let us start with the effects, lethal bombs. There are three of them, coal dust, shrapnels and taturas. You have no reason to use coal dust and shrapnels over the taturas. Taturas are insta-kills and silent. Coal dusts are even worse than shrapnels as they don't even one shot half the enemies in the game. The tutorial paints these as something you can use to disable enemies in crowds of civilians, but good luck finding situations like that anywhere else in the game. What is even more puzzling is that they are the rarest little bomb type for whatever reason. There are no downsides to using the Tatura bombs. They don't even damage you when you drop them at your feet, making them the only little bombs that are practical to use in open combat. There is no excuse to having three bomb types that all essentially serve the same purpose, but one is clearly better than the others. Tactical bombs. There are four of them. Smokes, Calp drops, Lamb's blood and Skunk soil. They all essentially have the same effects, incapacitating enemies and making them vulnerable to one-shot kills, as if the already easy combat necessitates that. Smoke bombs are the best of the four, as in addition to incapacitating enemies, they also obstruct vision, they have a lasting zone, and their ingredients are the most common. The game does try and balance it a bit by making the smoke so thick that you can only see through eagle vision, but that is still not much of a hurdle. You can still see the white highlights and health bars through the smoke. Cal drops do make a lasting zone, but they do not obstruct vision, making them already redundant. Skunk oil bombs are kinda unique in that any enemy directly hit with it will remain still, while his friends will move away, but there is really no point to this effect. Lamb's blood bombs are easily the weakest as they don't even have a lasting effect. While they can panic weaker enemies, they are still pretty much useless. It is also interesting to note that they don't even have a tutorial mission dedicated to them, which leads me to believe that even the devs had a hard time justifying their existence. There is no reason to use anything other than smoke bombs. In addition to being the most common, they do everything that the other bombs do, and even more. Diversionary bombs. There are three of them. Smoke decoys, cherry bombs, and pyrite coin bombs. Now, this is the rare moment where I will actually praise Revelations. The diversionary bombs are well designed, as they all have distinct effects and uses. Smoke decoys will only distract enemies who see them, while cherries will distract anyone who hears them. They can be used to influence the movement of cars and open up lots of opportunities in how you approach your missions. There was a time where I considered the pyrite bombs to be absolute garbage, but upon some testing for this video, I discovered that there is something here. They are unique, but very inconsistent. The pyrites have two effects. They make nearby civilians tackle aggressive cars like the Vigilantes from Brotherhood and AC1, and they sometimes create a plane spot. In regards to the second effect, there are times where the entire radius is covered in a plane zone, but other times where you're standing legs wide open for detection. They also suffer in regards to the other distraction bombs as they need a good amount of civilians nearby to actually be usable, and these situations are very few and far between. Their inconsistency and the lack of possible scenarios where you could utilize them is holding them back, but conceptually I really do like them. Much like the lamb's plot, they are also missing a tutorial mission, so even the devs couldn't find a situation where they could be put to use. The redundancies of bomb crafting don't stop with the effects, for the shells are also guilty of this. There are four shells. Impacts, stickies, bouncing and tripwires. Impact shells. You have no reason to use anything else. These only need a direct line of sight to be effective, which is very easy to achieve given how Istanbul has rooftops practically everywhere. They are also the most common shells and the only practical ones you could use in combat. Sticky shells. These have a 5 second fuse, making them already inferior to impacts. They do have a special mechanic where enemies don't detect them landing near them or on them until they explode, but what is the point of that when impacts don't need any delay for their effects to go off? Bouncing shells. These have a 3 second fuse, better than the stickies but still worse than the impacts. Their claim to fame is their ability to bounce off surfaces, potentially leading to scenarios where you could bomb someone without a direct line of sight. 
But again, it is very easy to get to a higher elevation and just not bother with the imprecise bounces. Trip wires. These have to be placed, and anyone stepping near them will cause them to go off. Great in theory, and I will say that Eagle Vision actually highlights enemy patrol routes, meaning that you can set them up in the right spots. But why bother with that when impact shells are just so much faster and more consistent? What about the gunpowder though? There are three types, each stronger than the last. In theory, they can be used to limit civilian casualties. But ask yourself this. When was the last time you saw a civilian near anyone you would use a bomb on? Civilians don't typically spawn in restricted areas or on rooftops. You have no reason to use anything other than a British gunpowder, unless you have simply been unlucky in retrieving it. You may use the lower yield gunpowder for the smoke decoys or cherry bombs, as their effects seem to be the same regardless of the gunpowder. But that is because you will be saving on the more valuable British gunpowder, not because of some inherent tactical advantage. So, there are 10 different effects, but only 5 of them are really worth using. There are 4 casings, but anything other than the impact shells make the delivery mechanisms needlessly convoluted. There are 3 types of gunpowder, but you will only ever use one. It is very telling that out of the 120 possible bomb combinations, only two made a return in AC3. And when Unity introduced similar mechanics to the bombs, it didn't even bother with the crafting. I also promised to talk about the bomb tutorials, so I guess this is the best time to do it. Much like the rest of the side content, they are very short and linear. It makes sense for a tutorial, but when these missions came at the cost of previously engaging side content, it is still an issue. They have practically zero story behind them, and what little there is, is conveyed through the pre-mission text box. They are so linear that they will tell you the exact spot where you need to walk, the exact spot where you need to stand, and the exact spot where you have to throw the bomb. There is absolutely no thought required on behalf of the player, and there is absolutely no room for experimentation. It also needs to be mentioned how utterly ridiculous some of these mission conditions are in order to prop up the otherwise useless bombs. Let's take the sticky shell tutorial. You are forced to stand in one spot, stick a bomb on a passing guard, and have that bomb explode as the guard passes next to the target. Name one other situation in the game where you can use a sticky bomb in this manner. If you remove the mission restrictions, there is absolutely nothing stopping you from making a longer throw or throwing the bomb from a nearby platform. Or the bouncy shell tutorial. Once again, you are forced to stand in one spot, throw a bomb at the highlighted wall and have its blast eliminate the target. Or the tripwire tutorial. Put the bomb in the designated spot, wait, kill the target and leave. These missions are so linear to the point that it is almost impossible to even fill the optional objectives. Special mention goes out to the Caltrop tutorial where the optional objective requires you not to swim. Despite taking place in an area where falling into water is not a concern. To end on a bit of a positive note, I will say that there is room for creativity here. If you are bored, which is very likely given the lack of content in this game, you can make some truly spectacular and impractical combos with those bombs. But even then, apart from a handful of missions and a Templar dance, there are very few situations where you can actually make use of the bombs. If the game had about as much side content as Brotherhood, I might even forgive the redundancies of bomb crafting. But as it is right now, it is still something for me to complain about. I am going to dedicate this part to complaints that I couldn't put anywhere else. Revelations removed horse riding and all the improvements that Brotherhood made to it. It does sort of make sense given the heavily urbanized setting of the game, but it also removed something that added a lot of depth to Brotherhood. One feature that I felt was really unappreciated in Brotherhood was Rome changing as you renovated buildings and improved the lives of its citizens. The annoying beggar women were replaced with the annoying bards, and the citizens started looking healthier and wealthier as you went on in the game. Nothing of the sort happens in Revelations. Revelations also screwed up the challenges the Brotherhood introduced. For whatever reason, they are now divided into different tiers. You cannot earn the rewards unless you complete all the challenges from a specific tier. Brotherhood had the earning rewards based on the number of challenges completed. This change just makes the game more unrewarding. Take a look at these examples. In Brotherhood I would have already earned the first or second set of rewards. In Revelations I have earned none of them, despite completing roughly the same number of challenges. Even if you weren't trying to specifically complete all the challenges in Brotherhood, you still completed some of them as you were just playing the game. And still learn the rewards. In Revelations, the already minor rewards take more effort to obtain. 
Special shoutout goes to the second tier bomb challenge reward that gives you more space to carry your bombs. Even though you can already craft your predetermined bomb in your inventory at any time. Revelations also added cannon placements to the dens. These stupid things can detect you instantly and I am convinced that they can shoot you through walls too. The hook and throw maneuver is literally useless. Compared to your average counter, it is harder to pull off, interrupts your killstreaks and doesn't even work on half the enemies. Revelations has boarded up wells that can be blown open with coal dust or shrapnel bombs. Istanbul has absolutely no shortage of hiding places. I truly have no idea why the developers wasted their time and talents on such a pointless feature. I only noticed these things on my third playthrough, that's how insignificant they were. The stalker enemies are also so rare that I have had situations where the only thing stopping me from earning 100% completion is a challenge that requires you to kill 5 of them. The same can be said for the couriers, except they are even more rare, to the point that they might not as well exist. The previous games had simple 2 down maps, Revelations looks like a modern art piece. It may not look so bad now, but believe me, it is a nightmare to use if you're being chased by guards. The game also has this too, I'm not even sure if you can call it side content, but civilian interactions. Basically, you can perform menial labor or fight on the streets. These will reward you with useless money or bomb ingredients. They're not even that bad for what they're supposed to be, I just wish there were more of these. You can also pull down scaffolding to kill guards while you are running. So the one part of the world that was already made redundant with the killstreak system has another useless function. You may have noticed a theme here with the gameplay aspects that I have been complaining about for the last 20 minutes. Almost every new addition to the game is completely redundant or pointless. And perfectly functional content from the previous games was either lowered in quantity or removed altogether. When the other games added features, you could usually tell what the developers were thinking with them, even if they didn't always succeed. I did not like the killstreak system that Brotherhood introduced, because it made combat even easier and made many features of combat redundant. Despite that, it was added to this way the heavy counter kill spam that the first two games had, and in this role it was successful. Or the tailing missions. Most of the community seems to hate them, but they are one of the few moments where you can meaningfully utilize social stealth. Can anyone please tell me why there are three lethal bomb types in Revelations when one is clearly better than the others? What is the point of boarded up wells when there are hiding spots everywhere? Why on earth would you use the hook and throw maneuver over your regular counter kill? When Revelations adds new features, I am left scratching my soon to be boarding head. All of this reeks of wasted developer time. Developer time that could have been used to add more side content. As a result, Revelations has far less replay value than the other games do. The new gameplay mechanics are shallow, and even if they weren't, there wouldn't be enough missions for you to utilize them in any way. So, as we just saw, Revelations fails, both from a narrative and gameplay perspective. Despite these obvious flaws, it doesn't seem to stop the fanbase from creaming all over it. Revelations has this almost mythological reverence surrounding it. It was the last great EC game that would have taken us all over the rainbow if AC3 hadn't come along. People are willing to go through some truly insane mental gymnastics in order to justify the state of this game. The game doesn't have a lack of content, it is condensed, and I never liked the side content in Brotherhood anyway. The story isn't poorly written, it is subtle storytelling and you're just too tense to understand it. All of this comes across as apologism. Players are admitting that they are getting less out of their money, and they are writing the story for the developers to boot. Revelations isn't some underrated hidden gem. It is a blatantly incomplete game that did more harm to the franchise than AC3, Unity, or even Odyssey. I can understand people being disappointed with the newer games, but that doesn't make Revelations retroactively better. The fanbase loves rewriting history to the point that they must be having part-time jobs writing propaganda for the Russian government. The only reason Revelations is held in such high regard is blind nostalgia. There are a couple of bitter pills that the fanbase needs to swallow regarding these games. Assassin's Creed is now an RPG because you used to complain about the other games being too similar to one another. Stealth has always been shit in these games. Connor is a better character than Ezio. Santa Claus isn't real, and Revelations is indeed the worst game in the franchise. Thanks for watching, feel free to post derogatory comments down below.
I'm exhausted. Yeah, me too, but... You know, I'm really wired. What do you say I take you home and eat your pussy? <laughs>